All right, so welcome to this, uh, this latest edition of uh, Cerner Text Talks. Uh, so today uh, we have a, a pretty nice guest. I'm pretty uh, happy that he was able to make it here and, and talk to us. Uh, so this is uh, Josh Wills. Uh, he's a director of data science at Cloudera uh, and also the author of the Apache Crunch project that we use pretty extensively uh, here at Cerner. So uh, I've worked with Josh a little bit off and on over the, over the past year, and uh, he's always been really helpful, really uh, glad to answer questions. and. Uh, um, and and has, I think has helped us be successful in a lot of things that we're doing in the Hadoop ecosystem with Crunch and, and some things that we're trying to build on top of that. So uh, with that, I'll just uh, let Josh take over, and uh, he's going to uh, talk to us today about uh, basically uh, building production machine learning systems uh, and taking it to the factory. So Absolutely. go ahead. Thanks, man. Thanks very much. How's it going, everybody? You can hear me okay? Good. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, uh, Ryan, Ryan knocked me down a notch. Uh, my, my title is actually Senior Director of Data Science. Hopefully next year I can become the Senior Senior Director of Data Science. Aspirational. Uh, so let's, let's start off with a hard question. Um, what exactly is a data scientist? What, what precisely does that term mean? A couple of different definitions I've seen that I like. Uh, here's the first one I saw. Uh, data scientist is a data analyst who lives in California, right? <laughs> It's a very popular definition. Um, and I love this definition. I love it because it's very funny, and we get to make fun of sort of pretentious California people, and that's always, that's always a fun time. Uh, but I also love it because it's an example of, of bad data analysis. Um, in particular, it's an example of mistaking correlation and causation, uh, just because it happens to be the case that a lot of data scientists live in California or live in San Francisco does not mean that just because you live in California and you're a data analyst, you're therefore a data scientist, right? Uh, that also is the sort of unfortunate, unfortunate effect of excluding data scientists who live in Chicago and New York and Kansas City and all kinds of other nice places, right? So uh, this is my definition. Um, this, is, uh, this is really my, my major contribution to Western civilization. Like if I die tomorrow, this will be like on my tombstone. Uh, a data scientist is someone who is better at statistics than any software engineer and better at software engineering than any statistician, right? That's not bad. As far as 140 characters go, that's like a reasonably good definition. Um, it's been retweeted something like 800 times now, which is, gives me roughly the same level of Twitter credibility as whatever Justin Bieber had for breakfast this morning. So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, right, roughly speaking. So that is, that is a data scientist. And you know, the thing I like about this definition is that it kind of reflects for me the two kinds of data scientists that I see and that I've run into in my life. Um, the two kinds, sort of one is, one is the lab data scientist, all right? The lab data scientist is, is a statistician who sort of by hook or by crook got really good at programming, kind of because they had to, right? They had some problem they were working on that required them to learn a lot of Python or a lot of C++, and they really got into data processing and programming and, and became very gifted at it. And we see this in, in all the sciences, right? There are neuroscientists and social scientists and geneticists. And these are, these are kind of like my lab data scientists. Um, and then the other side of the fence is the factory, the factory data scientist, which I sort of characterize as like a software engineer who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and, and how this sort of happens is, you know, there'll be an engineer who gets hired at some little startup that decides one day that it needs a recommendation engine, or it needs like some sort of, you know, machine learning system for predicting fraud or ad clicks or something like that. And this sort of, this sort of software engineer, it's typically the kind of software engineer who, seems like really, really smart, um, but isn't like obviously useful. You know what I'm talking about? I think like we all sort of know someone like this, right? Um, software Jew is like, okay, this person really is very clever, um, but it seems hard to actually get them to like pay attention to anything for an extended period of time or that sort of thing. That's usually the person who gets tasked with writing the recommendation engine or something like that. That is the software engineer who's in the wrong place at the wrong time and will basically pick up a book on machine learning and learn all of this stuff and like build the first recommendation engine at the company and then build the second one and the third one and so on and so forth. And those, are, those are my factory data scientists. Those are the people who build data products, people who work on search ranking and you know, anomaly detections and fraud detection and ad prediction, all that kind of great stuff. That's, that's sort of the other side of the coin. That's honestly the side that, that really excites me. Um, I don't really know where I fit, to be honest with you. Um, before I was at Cloudera, I've been at Cloudera for like two and a half years or so. Before I worked at Cloudera, I worked at Google for about three and a half years. My first job at Google um, was working on the ad auction. Like you do a search on Google and ads show up, like that was me. 
You're welcome. <laughs> Nobody ever thanks me for that. That's not true. I actually went to an ad tech conference once, and they stood up and applauded. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so I, I don't really know quite where I fit. I think, um, so when Google hired me, they actually hired me as a statistician. Um, I do not think that at the time, or even actually at, the, at this time right now, I was good enough of a software engineer to get hired at Google as a software engineer. I don't think I would have made it past like the software engineering interview. It's a really hard interview. Um, so I got hired as a statistician. But as soon as I got in the door, all I did was write code. That was all I did. I just I didn't actually like analyze data or anything like that. What I was interested in was working on these systems and like working on models, uh, running experiments. That was what really did it for me. That's what I've always really, really enjoyed. So eventually they kind of moved me over to the software engineering ladder and that was where I stayed. So, uh, but let's, let's talk about these two different data scientists. Let's talk about like what their lives are like and how they work, all right? So this is, this is data science in the lab now. And I think sort of the popular perception of data science in the lab is something like this, which is this tweet from Big Data Borat. Uh, data science is statistics on a Mac. You guys can note that I favorited that tweet. Um, despite that though, I kind of hate this tweet. Um, if I ever find Big Data Borat, I'm gonna have words with him or her. Uh, so this is like data science is, is basically like, you know, statistics done by a hipster, essentially, like some, some idiot in a hoodie and cool glasses with, with his Mac, uh, calling, calling himself a statistician who's calling himself a data scientist. Um, and I kind of want to talk about the genesis of this a little bit. Um, and the sort of, the kind of like analytics, the kind of like traditional reporting that I think a lot of people think of when we think of advanced analytics, um, I, call, I call investigative analytics, all right? Now, investigative analytics is really like analytics in the sort of in, ser in search of understanding something, in search of answering some question, all right? It's very interactive, it's very ad hoc. I have some data set, I'm running queries against it, I'm doing visualizations, like all that kind of cool stuff. Um, I'm typically working with like a fairly fixed data set, like my data set is like static somewhere, it's some, you know, temporary table I created and I'm exploring and I'm maybe loading up into memory, you know, maybe using a tool like like pandas in the Python stack or R or SAS or something like that, right? And I have lots and lots of great tools for investigative analytics. Um, our good friends at Tableau, our good friends at MicroStrategy, our good friends at Zoom Data, our good friends at Revolution, our good friends at SAS. Lots and lots of tools that are oriented towards helping like lab sort of oriented statisticians, investigative oriented statisticians uh, do their jobs well. Now for the most part, the inputs and outputs of this process. Now, the inputs and outputs, the input is typically like a data warehouse of some sort. For reasons passing understanding, when I did a Google image search for data warehouse, that was the image that came up with. I'm not quite sure what exactly that means, um, but nonetheless, typically like it's a data warehouse. It's a fairly cleaned, normalized, standardized, uh, you know, star schema set of data that we're doing our analysis against. And then the output of it is gonna be usually something like a report, right? Some, some, something that's like designed to help someone make a better decision, maybe a dashboard, right? Occasionally, maybe something like an in-database scoring model where we're actually gonna take a model, deploy it to a database and do some scoring inside there. That's, that's typically what we do when we're doing investigative analytics. And the, the output we're looking for uh, is what business people call actionable insights. I mean, I feel like a lot of my job, you know, is, is basically defining things in some sense. Like there's sort of marketing terms, like things that, or at least, things that people think are marketing terms, things like big data or data scientist, right? Um, and actionable insights is another one of those terms for me. It's like one of those terms people use that I don't really understand what it is they're talking about, like roughly speaking. Um, so I've come up with like a sort of valid definition for actionable insights. By the way, actionable insights, kind of the exact opposite happens when you do a Google image search for that. You get this awesome picture of, of David Hasselhoff. Um, but an actionable insight is one that allows us to make like a clear decision. Right? We can actually like, take this, this bit of information and like, choose an obviously correct path. And my experience has been that that hardly ever happens. Like, actionable insights are very, very rare. Right? We kind of like, prize them. They are precious in business um, because we're terrified of making like, a wrong decision. Like, there's nothing really worse in business than making a wrong decision. A great way to get fired is to make a wrong decision. And so we either like don't really do much of anything, we're just kind of like frozen in place, like not doing anything differently, or if we do end up making a decision, we're maybe like not super interested in like doing a lot of follow-up to see if that decision was any good. Because if we find out that it was actually a bad decision, that's like not good. We don't actually want people to find that out. Um, the closest thing I've come up with that I would consider like a real actionable insight 
is when we correlate some short-term behavior with a long-term outcome that we care about. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Um, Netflix Prize, right? Back in the day, 2006, Netflix offers a million dollars for uh, people to come up with a better recommendation algorithm, right? And Netflix wasn't doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They weren't trying to like advance the state of the art in, in machine learning in any sense, although that was like an outcome of that, of that competition. Um, Netflix had a really big problem to solve, which was making sure that people renewed their Netflix subscriptions. That is, that is what Netflix is interested in. They want you to renew your subscription for another month. And at the time, back in 2006, the single like, best predictor of you renewing your Netflix account for another month was the size of your queue, the number of movies in your Netflix queue. That was like the single best predictor. So anything they could do to get you to add more movies to your queue was a good thing as far as they were concerned. And that was the genesis of their recommendation engine, right? Now, I mean, of course, you know, since then, it took like about two years or so for someone to actually beat the Netflix challenge. And it was kind of funny, by that time, Netflix's business had actually evolved, right? They were moving out of like shipping people DVDs and into kind of a streaming business um, where the length of your queue didn't really matter that much anymore. I don't know about you guys, I think I've had the same movies in my Netflix queue for like three years now, and they just kind of sit there. It doesn't, it's not really a big deal the way it used to be when they were mailing stuff to you, right? But, but it is that kind of thing, the short-term behavior the short-term behavior of adding a movie to your queue influenced the long-term outcome that they cared about. Um, people have done similar studies uh, around a losing weight. How do you reliably like, lose weight and keep it off? And it turns out there are sort of three short-term behaviors you can do to help that. Um, the first one is to eat breakfast. Eat breakfast every single day. Second one is to weigh yourself. Weigh yourself every single day. And the third one is to have exercise equipment out like available where you can see it, like it's in your face, it's like right there, uh, and easy for you to access. Something that's like not hidden under the, clout, the couch or the bed or the closet, something like that. Those are three like short-term behaviors that are correlated with a long-term outcome that we care about. That is, that is a true actionable insight, right? Okay, I think I've beat this dead horse enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into another topic now. Um, all right, so let's talk a little different. Let's uh, think about something different. This is, this is data science in the factory, all right? Now, data scientists, we love Venn diagrams. Really, nothing makes a data scientist happier than a Venn diagram. Uh, this, this is a sort of a, a new one. This is a, a take by a, a data scientist named Harlan Harris, who lives out in DC. Uh, and this was his data products Venn diagram, all right? And this, this was the whole idea that data products combine software, domain expertise, and statistical models, right, in some way in order to solve a problem. Right? And you can kind of compare a data product to like any sort of you know, combination of these two elements. Right? So domain knowledge plus sort of statistics, predictive analytics, gets us one-off analyses. It gets us things like investigative analytics. That's effectively what investigative analytics is. Um, if we're just doing kind of statistics in conjunction with software engineering, but it's not really relevant to any particular domain or any particular problem, uh, we end up with BI and stats tools, things like R, things like SAS. That's what they're, that's what they're there for. They're like just vessels with which you can fill up domain expertise and sort of specific problems to solve, right? And then finally, if we're just doing kind of domain knowledge and software engineering, but there's not really much in the way of statistical modeling going on, we're essentially deploying business rules, right? That's basically a business rules engine for all intents and purposes, okay? So when we do, uh, when we build data products, when we think about data products, there's a shift in perspective relative to investigative analytics, okay? Instead of being very question driven and very like sort of ad hoc and interactive, uh, our focus is on metrics. There's usually like a, a metric or a well-defined set of metrics we are really trying to optimize for, okay? Less interested in understanding, more interested in optimization in some sense. Uh, we want things to be automated and systematic and transparent. We care about the same sort of things we care about with production systems that we care about when we're building operational models and data products. The worst thing that can happen to us is that we build a model that's too complicated for us to understand. All right, and like, don't laugh, this actually does happen sometimes. Um, I have a favorite story along these lines. I've told it publicly before, so, and no one's sued me yet, so I think it'll be okay. Um, when I was very uh, new to Google, very early at Google in 2007, uh, to, you guys remember like late 2007, early 2008, the economy was kind of like imploding, right? People, not all of you were in college at that time, so I remember, at least, at least some of you must be aware of that. Uh, so Google obviously keeps track of how many ads they're showing every day on Google.com. And they noticed for like a couple of weeks, the number of ads being shown was falling at like a fairly steady clip. 
And they're like, okay, well, that's kind of weird, but the economy's not doing so great. Maybe people are, you know, sort of lowering their ad budgets, stopping buying ads, that kind of thing. So Google has a bunch of knobs and kind of like, you know, tuning parameters and all kinds of stuff they can use to control how many ads are shown. Uh, and the sort of the main control is actually this big wheel that was inside of Eric Schmidt's office at the time. <laughs> you just kind of go into the office and just turn the wheel to control how many ads were shown. It was a good, sort of like the price is right, you know, like the big, no, not really. <laughs> if wishing made it so. Anyway, uh, so that was what they did. They grabbed the big wheel and they turned it. They kind of turned down a, a very important parameter and, and cranked up the number of ads. And they noticed, like, obviously the metrics like, went back up for about a day. And then they started falling steadily again, right? Uh, and people basically started freaking out um, because I think it was at that point they realized that they had built a system that was too complicated for them to understand. There were so many like different feedback loops, right? It's like machine learning systems providing the input to other machine learning systems whose output was being fed back, all this kind of stuff. Uh, that They couldn't really reason about how the system worked anymore. It took them a couple of months to like really instrument everything and sort of take, shut pieces down and figure out like what exactly was going on. Um, but at the time, I'm like very new to this place, right? I'm new to Google. And when you're, when you're new to Google, you get assigned a mentor. My mentor was a guy named Daniel Wright. Uh, and so your mentor is basically there to answer any stupid question you can come up with that you're too embarrassed to ask your manager. So at the time I asked Daniel, Daniel, is it possible that the ad system has become self-aware? <laughs> Ooh, that's been bad. And that it doesn't like ads. <laughs> Something to consider, right? Automated, systematic, transparent. These are the things we care about when we're building data products, right? Um, we also have a difference in our data. Our data is typically very, very fluid, right? With data products, when we're building search engines, when we're building like recommendation engines, we are often getting feedback in real time as to whether or not we're doing a good job, right? And this feedback can be incorporated immediately to improve our models, to make our system better. So we have to figure out a good way to do that as well. And then last but not least, instead of kicking out like a PDF file or a dashboard, we're actually kicking out a production system, something that actually runs in production and is making customer-facing decisions, either to make us more money, make our customers happier, save us money, something like that. So very, very different output and a very different perspective we take when we build these things. So all of this for me, all this for me means that data science isn't statistics on a Mac. Uh, data science in the factory is like decision engineering. I haven't really come up with the right term for this yet, so I'm gonna go with decision engineering for now. Um, I cribbed this image from uh, United. There was a sort of a United uh, example image online. I mean, obviously, I've cribbed all these images from somewhere. Um, but this one, this one I love. This is a page that United would show you uh, in order to like, basically get you to upgrade to first class after you've like, booked a flight with them, right? And I see this page, and I just see like hundreds of decisions they had to make when they were like, creating this page, right? What should the image be? Uh, how much should they charge you, right? What should the wording of the phrases be? How should things be laid out on the page? You guys will note there's a timer here at the bottom. This premium seating offer will expire in 30 seconds. How do you decide whether a timer should go there? How do you decide how long the timer should be? What would you do for this population versus this population, a frequent flyer person versus just a regular customer? How do you make all of these decisions, right? Um, this sort of stuff, as, as I feel that like, as we see more and more of our interactions with our customers, with our users, doctors, patients, all this kind of good stuff, moving into the digital realm, we will be faced with more and more and more of these decisions that we have to make. And we will be powering a lot of them with some kind of data product. Because I believe, and this is sort of one of those great, you know, uh, kind of silly specious things that fits nicely into a headline, that, that all products will become data products. Okay, and you notice there's an asterisk next to the all. Um, all with an asterisk means all products that matter. All products of any consequence, I believe, will become data products. Um, and my sort of, my favorite example of this is actually the Twitter, uh, Twitter follower feed, right? So Twitter for a long time was like the simplest, you know, dumbest product you can imagine, right? It's just a list of people you follow sorted by time. That's it, right? No smarts. I mean, that, there's a ton of systems engineering to actually make that work, as we all know. Uh, but nothing really like custom, nothing really personalized. Until recently, Twitter introduces their conversation view. Right? So now that basically Twitter is like keeping track of conversations and reordering tweets uh, based on like kind of reflecting the conversation. So tweets from like old times can like pop up to the top of my feed, that sort of thing. And now this to me, this makes Twitter's really simple, stupid, sorted list of tweets by time 
into a data product because there's a whole bunch of questions I have about how this works. Uh, how old does a conversation have to be before it no longer gets promoted to the top of my feed? Uh, to what extent does like my relationship with these people and their relationship with each other feed into the decision whether or not to promote the conversational view? Because they don't always promote conversational views, right? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. There's all this like additional information that goes into making this decision. They've created this enormous parameter space that they now have to like optimize over for different users um, in order to like maximize, I'm assuming, some sort of engagement metric with your Twitter feed. That's what they're going for. So even like the simplest, dumbest, most straightforward product in the world, at least online, is becoming a data product because it's a really, really important product. And it's important that it be optimized in every way possible. All right. So, great job, Josh. You've convinced us all about this whole operational analytics data products thing. Who's doing it? The answer is, of course, basically no one. No one is doing this, right? A couple of companies are doing this. Google does this, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Amazon, handful of others, right? But, but by and large, nobody's really doing this, right? Um, most models that get deployed in kind of a production context, it happens in like one of two ways. Um, one is, of course, in database scoring. Right, sort of like a marketing campaign, or we're gonna do like some email targeting or deal targeting. We'll build a model um, and we'll deploy it inside of a database and we'll do like use like a SaaS system or a PMML library or something like that in order to score our records in our database and come up with some outputs and then we'll just email those people. Right? That's that's sort of deployment in some sense. Um, the other sort of like version of this actually makes me very sad. Um, and that's a lot of people who have to do real serious modeling, like credit card companies, people who have like really big kind of uh, fraud and risk problems. They build the model. They build the model every six months or every 12 months or something like that, right? It is the one true model. And then some poor software engineer has to like basically like hand copy this thing from SAS or R or whatever into C or Java and deploy it into a production system. This is a terrible job. Like, I would not wish this job on my worst enemy, right? Um, really just fairly tedious and awful. Like, it's a very low-level engineering assignment. And I'm, I'm going to argue, like, why this is bad in a second or why this is sort of holding, holding these companies back. Um, but I'm just going to ask you guys just to have a moment of silence for the poor engineers who have to do this process. So that's, just, that's just terrible, right? Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, let's talk for about, I just want to explore a couple of the reasons why no one's really doing operational stuff. Like why operational analytics is still such a sort of like very tiny thing that only like the, a handful of web companies are doing. Um, and I think a lot of this stuff, sort of a lot of the fault for this um, can be blamed on, on people like myself. Um, one of these things is that uh, machine learning is not an engineering discipline right now. Like not even close. Like machine learning is like voodoo black magic right now, like by and large. People get like really, really married to their particular algorithm or their particular way of doing things, when essentially at the, end of, at the end of the day, almost everyone is doing stochastic gradient descent with a few little tweaks here and there. Like the algorithms are honestly not that different from each other the vast majority of the time, right? Now, there are aspects of building machine learning models that like sort of feel, you know, like feel kind of applicable and feel approachable to software engineers, things like pipeline building, like often we're building kind of pipelines, that, that sort of stuff. But the pieces that are lacking, um, diagnostics are a real problem. It's not always obvious when machine learning models fail why they failed, like what was sort of the limitation? Why does it work on this data set and not work on this data set? Um, there's a lot of kind of black magic around parameter tuning. Um, this is especially true in things like deep learning. Like a lot of these sort of like very fancy deep learning models that claim to do a lot of the work for you have like you know 40 or 50 or 100 parameters that you have to tune in, in like a fairly kind of black artsy sort of way. Um, so machine learning is nothing even remotely like an engineering discipline right now. And this is, this is like our fault as sort of, I'm, I'm including myself in this, not you guys so much, although I mean like Ryan Brush, but aside from that, no one else, um, <laughs> as being to blame for at least some of this stuff, right? That's sort of problem one. This is not an engineering discipline yet. Uh, number two for this is I'm gonna blame statisticians. Uh, I'm gonna blame sort of a particular academic statisticians. It's awesome that we're recording this so they can see me blaming them. Um, we tend to teach like statistics and sort of advanced statistics, academic statistics, in a way that is not very approachable for computer scientists, okay? If you guys have taken a sort of advanced statistics class in college, uh, there are a lot of integrals. You have to do a lot of multivariate calculus, like sort of Bayesian theory and stuff like that. At the core of it, 
um, it's really kind of fundamentally about your ability to integrate functions. That's, that's kind of what it's about. Um, and in my mind, like I'm, I was a math major in college, and I sort of have like kind of a, a two by two matrix that helps me think about math majors or sort of math people in general, quantitative people in general. Uh, there are people who are kind of fundamentally like oriented towards discrete math, like graph theory, combinatorics, that kind of stuff. And people who are fundamentally oriented towards continuous math, like continuous functions, things like calculus, that sort of thing. So that's like one axis, that's one two by two. Um, and then there are people who are uh, symbol manipulators. They just basically like manipulate formulas, move bits around, that kind of thing. And then there are geometers. Okay, people who like really think about problems geometrically in, in sort of a non-trivial sense. And that can, those sort of two things are orthogonal to each other. And I find that uh, most sort of academic statisticians are kind of in these sort of continuous math, uh, geometric way of thinking. A lot of things we talk about in statistics like degrees of freedom, that's, that's actually a geometric concept. Like this guy, R.A. Fisher, who founded a lot of modern statistics, really thought about the world geometrically. He was like fundamentally a geometer, and that was how he saw things. And he could do some very powerful stuff with that methodology. Um, but that sort of language and that sort of way of thinking does not necessarily speak to most computer scientists who are, in my experience, kind of discrete math uh, symbol manipulators. They're like pretty far away from each other in space. Um, the funny thing is to me, though, when you get sort of advanced enough in statistics, when you get through all the calculus and all the kind of multivariate integrals and all that good stuff, um, you find on the other side functions that are basically too hard to integrate. Like things that you basically have to fall back to, things like simulation in order to calculate, right? And I actually believe that we could teach an advanced statistics course primarily and almost entirely from a computational perspective. So it, it's sort of like a new kind, like I'm making fun of, of Stephen Wolfram here, a new kind of science, a new kind of statistics. I think we could teach statistics without requiring anyone to integrate anything, at least for as long as possible. And I think that if we did that, if we could kind of show people that in the last 30 years or so, um, we really have come up with like many new statistical methods that are really much more accessible than a lot of like the calculus-based stuff we had before, we could teach a much broader audience, a much broader audience of software engineers about statistics and understand statistics in a way that I think would be massively, massively beneficial. All right. I haven't quite figured out how to do this yet. A lot of the stuff is sort of potential for me. Uh, there's a book, it's, uh, it's got the sort of modest, humble title that I like. It's called All of Statistics. Um, and it's written by a guy, I, I'm gonna, uh, it's, his last name is Wasserman, and I feel bad because I can't remember his first name right now, and I don't want to get it wrong on video. Um, but it's really, really good, and it teaches kind of all of probability and all of statistics from a fundamentally computational perspective. And uh, if you're, you know, super bored and have lots of free time and would like to learn more about this stuff, I highly recommend it. It's a great book, all right? So anyway, machine learning is not an engineering discipline. We don't do a great job of teaching statistics to software engineers. Uh, here's thing three. Uh, this is a little a bit of data analysis I did. This is actually about as much data analysis as I ever do these days. Um, I got on Google Trends, because uh, I've sort of had this hypothesis for a while. Uh, this is the, sort of the rise and the growth in searches for the term data scientist, that's in blue, and DevOps in red. Uh, and so anyway, there's sort of clearly a correlation here uh, between kind of the rise of DevOps and the rise of data science. And because I am a data scientist, I can say that this is actually a causal relationship. <laughs> I'm allowed to do that. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's good stuff. Mm. But, uh, you know, my feeling, is, my feeling is very much strongly oriented toward the fact that data science needs DevOps. Uh, deploying models in production, it requires kind of a DevOps mentality, right? It requires, like, moving very quickly, iterating very quickly, being very agile. Um, Organizations that are really trying to do kind of operational models and data products without a DevOps kind of environment to do it in uh, are not going to do that well. Like DevOps is, is a prerequisite for me in many ways for data science. All right, that's sort of the last one there. What I would like to get to for machine learning is really like information retrieval. Because search for me, so I really, I very much think of search as a data product. Right? I think of like search ranking and figuring out what the results should be ordered in. That is a data product to me, just like a recommendation engine or recommending ads or really anything like that. Those, that is a data product for me. And information retrieval has really gone from this like very interesting, very abstract academic discipline to the sort of thing where now basically any reasonably smart software engineer who is probably somewhat useless can be given a book 
right, and a copy of Lucene, and they can basically build a search engine, right? They can learn how do I index numeric fields and dates and stuff like that. And there's actually enough kind of practice out there in terms of how to do all these things and enough open source tools and sort of information um, to make information retrieval into as much of an engineering discipline as it is kind of a research activity right now. And that's, that's sort of the model I would like to aim for. I think information retrieval is a great, great model um, for us to kind of like aspire to be in the machine learning and data science community. Okay, so that's kind of meta stuff. Let's talk about some, some more practical things. Uh, lab to the factory, first steps. A couple of things that are just really, really important to get right. Uh, the first one, choosing a good problem. It's a didactic little parable that I absolutely love. Uh, so back in the 50s, uh, there was basically like an X Prize competition to see uh, if someone could build a human-powered airplane, like an airplane that could be powered like a bicycle, effectively speaking, okay? Someone put this competition out there. They offered a prize of like $50,000, which, I mean, you guys know, in like today's dollars, it's like $6 billion, right? So a lot of people super interested in this competition. Uh, and the way that the problem would typically be approached uh, is basically some professor would come up with a design, right? Figure out some, some kind of clever way to do a human-powered airplane get a team of graduate students together, build a plane for like nine months, put the thing together, take it out for a test flight, and it would crash after 10 seconds. It's like, oh, okay, well that, that didn't work, that's too bad. So next year, same professor, new design, new team of graduate students, another nine months, build a plane, take it out, crashes for like after 15 seconds. And it goes on and on and on for like this for like a decade, basically. Until one day some smart dude comes along and says, we're solving the wrong problem. The problem is not how do we build a human-powered airplane. The problem is how do we build an airplane that we can put back together again in a couple of hours? That's the problem we need to solve. And that was the problem they set out to solve. They built the plane out of like PVC pipes and a bunch of other really cheap materials that were very sturdy and easy to put back together. And they built their first plane and it crashed after like five seconds. But that was okay because they could build another plane the next day and another plane the next day after that. And they actually got so good at building airplanes, they could often try out multiple design ideas in the same day. And so they end up solving this problem, building this, this human-powered airplane that can actually fly in about six months, because during that time, they had tried out twice as many ideas as everyone else had in the previous nine years combined. The, like, the virtues of being really smart are massively overrated. Uh, and the virtues of being able to learn faster than other people are massively underrated. It is not about being really, really smart when it comes to doing this stuff. It's about being able to learn faster than the next person, all right? So that's step one. Choose a good problem. Choose a problem where you can learn quickly. That is really maybe the most important thing you can do when it comes to building data products. Step two, very important step. This is a proprietary acronym I've come up with. So do the simplest thing that could possibly work. I think I need another T in there, actually. Or maybe that I need to come up with a new acronym. Do the simplest thing that could possibly work. Um, I have been called the most anti-machine learning, machine learning expert in the world, and I wear that badge with pride. That's like maybe the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Um, do not start with the super advanced, complicated machine learning model uh, until you know that the problem you're solving is important enough to justify it. There's a very large, a very famous retailer uh, reasonably famous, let's go, let's, let's dial it down a notch, reasonably famous retailer, online retailer, that wanted to come up with a recommendation engine uh, to compete with Amazon, right? Like, what can we do in terms of recommendations to compete with Amazon? Uh, their very first recommendation engine recommended uh, sheets, like linens, to everyone. <laughs> that was all it did. It wasn't a fancy model, it was like literally, it was like a rule, just recommend sheets. Um, it took them a year to build a machine learning model that made more money than that recommendation engine. I know, that's kind of humbling, right? That's a, that's a blow right there. Uh, you think you're smart, just remember the sheets model, right? That is, that is the simplest thing that could possibly work. I, a friend of mine is working at a startup, they do kind of local business stuff in San Francisco, and they were meeting me, with me one day and they were asking me about recommendation engines for their, for their system. and. Uh, you know, they're asking me, like, okay, well, should we look at, you know, Mahout or this project or whatever? And I'm like, well, guys, you know, do you even know that your customers want recommendations, like, as part of using your product? Is that something they actually, like, think of your product as being for? And they're like, well, no. 
like, well, okay, maybe let's just like start there. What's your most popular kind of category? What's your most popular product? And they said, ice cream. I said, okay, recommend ice cream to everybody. Just recommend ice cream. I mean, yeah, you're gonna piss off people who are lactose intolerant, but aside from that, <laughs> by and large, is this even something people want? Do not invest a ton of time and effort and money and ego and all that kind of good stuff in building something super complicated and let, until you know something simple will work. Because honestly, it probably will. Remember the sheets. It should be like a, like a motto or something like a battle flag of some kind. Anyway. All right. Simplest thing that could possibly work. Step two. Step three. Um, log everything. Man, do I love log files. Did you guys read, uh, Jay Kreps wrote a blog post. Jay Kreps of LinkedIn wrote a blog post about log files at the end of last year, like in December. It's super long, but it's totally worth reading. Like I read it, I would read it to my kids at night as like a bedtime story, you know? <laughs> lay down, just like, get a lay down. This stuff's too important not to, not to get in there early. Man, I love log files. Like log files are the bread and butter of data science. Um, they give life to data science teams. They are like the River Nile. It's, it's that kind of thing. It's that important, right? A few reasons. Um, first and foremost, log files are unfiltered. Log files are reality. Log files reflect what actually happened. Um, I love data warehouses. They're incredibly useful, but they're also kind of like clean, pristine, normalized data um, that reflects truth, which is not necessarily the same thing as reality, right? That's not the same thing as what happened. And I, as a data scientist, care a lot about like, what actually happened. It's important that my machine learning model is not trained on some sort of clean, purified version of truth that doesn't actually exist anywhere in my operational systems. The input to my model has to be the real operational data. The model is going to see the same thing the system sees, so train the model on what the system is aware of. Right? That's number one. Uh, number two, log files are real time. Right? You set up something like Flume or a log saver, Scribe, that kind of thing. You can like, find out what was happening in the operational systems like 10 or 15 minutes after it actually happened versus like an ETL process that's going to run overnight, you know, take a snapshot of the database during kind of some downtime, copy it over, run a bunch of ETL routines, kick it out to the data warehouse. The log files, I can just get right at stuff. I can see like, literally what happened just, just recently. Um, and you know, last but not least, log files are a great way to keep your data scientists out of your operational systems. You do not want to let a guy like me inside of your operational systems running queries. That's a terrible idea. I will bring your operational systems down. I guarantee it, right? Don't, don't let that happen, right? Um, logs are the best. Yeah, I love log files. I love logs-based ETL. I love thinking um, log files are typically like highly, highly denormalized, right? They contain, so for instance, Google search logs, right? Google got into like log-based ETL because they never really had transactional systems. You know, a search engine is just, it's a search engine. It's just an index there that you read and serve, you know, serve queries out of. There's no database behind that. There was no database to write things to. There was no transaction, right? So the logs were like Google's initial source of data. So they logged everything, everything that was on the page, every URL, how long it took you to click something, every click, every mouse event. I mean, it's insane all the stuff they log, right? That is, that is their source of truth. And it's this kind of funny, it's like, it's like reverse ETL in a way. When you're doing logs-based ETL, you know, you're basically normalizing this denormalized log file into a star schema, unlike kind of classic ETL, where you're taking something that's in third normal form and mapping it into a star schema. Does that make sense? Like you're kind of going like the opposite way, which is, which is like tremendously fun. All right. I can see you guys getting a little restless. You're like, okay, shut up about log files already. Yeah. Um, if just, you know, if you read Jay Krebs's uh, blog post, that would make me happy. So that, I'd be satisfied with that. All right. And that's step three. Step four, hire more data scientists. Hire some more data scientists. People are always asking me, Josh, how do we hire data scientists? How do we find these mythical unicorn people who are better at statistics than any software engineer and better at software engineering than any statistician? And I'm like, you know, if you have meaningful problems to solve and an environment where people can iterate on those problems quickly, uh, you don't need to find data scientists. They will find you, right? They will be beating down your door. If you build it, they will come, that kind of thing. That is, that's where I want to work. Those are the places I want to work. I want my work to have impact, okay? I want it to like directly touch my customers' lives. That's, that's really what I want. Um, I get to do a little bit of this and then, and, you know, a little bit of that in this job, but, uh, but by, that, is, that is for me, that's where the good data scientists want to be. They will be beating down your door. Just advertise 
meaningful problems that you can iterate on quickly. That's all it takes, all right? So with that, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the things we're working on over at the Cloudera Data Science team. Yeah, if you can't read that in the back, it says, Escher, get your ass up here. Why don't you just take a moment for that? And I saw that earlier, I love that, that was funny. All right, uh, so again, you know, at Cloudera, I don't really have a real job, per se, right? I have kind of a fake job, um, so I, I talk a lot. Uh, and I, in exchange for talking a lot, I get to kind of work on whatever I want. So, you know, you guys are obviously like, you know, some of my favorite, favorite crunch users. Crunch is like how I relax. Crunch is like my weekend activity. Crunch is like how I wind down at the end of the day. Everyone's like, oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> Built our data pipelines on this thing? <laughs> I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, anyway, in my fake job, I have lots of free time to think about uh, not even think about problems, but think about meta problems. And one of the meta problems I think about a lot is, is the data science workflow. Uh, I think, I'm pretty sure I stole this slide from my friend Phil Goh, who's a professor at the, is it, I think it's, yeah, it's the University of Rochester. There, I got that right. He talks about kind of the process of doing data science, the process of building models. Uh, and I love these little boxes here. And uh, I'm trying to think, you know, is there sort of a preparation box up in the top corner there, like the reformat and clean data, and then we go into this kind of analysis cycle? What I would love is for these boxes to be scaled to the amount of time I spend doing these various activities. Except, of course, if you did that, like the reformat and clean data thing would be so ginormously huge, you know what I mean? It'd be like, it'd be like the size of Jupiter relative to like the rest of the planets in the solar system. It would just be absolutely insane. Um, all of my time is spent like cleaning and formatting data. That's, that's where all the work goes, right? Um, which is why I'm fond of saying that like ETL is the wax on, wax off of data science. Like ETL is how you build, I'm not kidding about this, ETL is how you build these sort of muscles as a developer, as a data scientist, um, as an organization for doing machine learning. Because all of machine learning is feature extraction, feature preparation uh, in order to feed into a model. Like the actual model fitting piece of it is like nothing. It is a round off error in the overall kind of like process. All right. So. Along with that workflow, um, I'm interested in identifying the bottlenecks in that workflow. I'm interested in identifying the pieces of that workflow that are hard, uh, that we don't, I'm actually mainly interested in bottlenecks that are so tiny that we don't even see them. Like we don't even kind of consider going across them because it just seems like so much work. And the question really becomes, how do we make this process much easier? And I got lucky last year, because uh, I ran to a guy named Sean Owen. He's incredibly handsome, so I put him in all my slide, my slide presentations. Um, Sean, uh, Sean has made me most famous for uh, writing Taste, which is the recommendation engine, the collaborative filtering engine in Mahout. And as, as far as I'm concerned, like far and away the best component of the Mahout project. So Sean had kind of left the project and was working a, a startup called Mirix over in London, working on kind of a next generation recommendation engine. The thing I loved about his recommendation engine was, was it didn't just fit models, it also served them. It came with like sort of a computational engine that would like build a model on the, like basically consume new data and build new models and a REST sort of Java server, right? A REST oriented Java server that would actually serve recommendations in production in real time. And he made like the gap, the bottleneck between building a model and deploying a model and doing something with a model in a production environment basically non-existent, right? It was just like instantaneous, you were gone, that was it. And I absolutely love that. So. Um, I convinced the Cloudera people, the, the people above me, to acquire his company, and we brought it in and we open sourced this stuff and called the project Oryx, uh, which is a, Oryx is sort of an Impala genus thing. Basically name all of our open source projects after African animals because of Hadoop, the elephant, that kind of thing, right? Uh, Oryx, so Oryx builds models and serves models. It has like the Mirix recommendation engine, like the sort of a, Mirix's recommendation engine is an alternating least squares model. It's based on like, the same model that was at the core of the Netflix prize. Uh, it has a k-means model, uh, k it's actually an algorithm called scalable k-means plus plus that I actually originally developed myself for Cloudera ML. Uh, and it has a random decision forest model for doing kind of classification and prediction. And it's the sort of the core idea is you build a model on data, you serve a model with a REST server, just back and forth, right? New data comes into the REST server, we write it out to HDFS, we build new models, we update the models we have, we serve new models over and over and over again. Because when we're working in an operational context, we have to think generationally. I have to think about building algorithms where 
the output of this model is gonna actually influence the data that I see for the next phase of my algorithm, right? If I'm serving you recommendations from this model, those recommendations are gonna influence the feedback I get for the next model I receive. If I'm making predictions and decisions that influence like what you do in a workflow, I have to be aware of the fact that like this model is actually like influencing the data it sees and I don't want this thing to become self-aware the way the Google ad system did. So we gotta be kind of careful about that stuff. We've been working on Oryx for a few months now. We open sourced it in November. And right now we're kind of primarily focused on the gaps, um, sort of the gaps that are sort of still left in the workflow. So one of the things we're working on now, uh, you know, for sort of historical reasons, a lot of Oryx was developed on top of MapReduce. And I think that we, like as a machine learning community and sort of as a Hadoop community, are starting to kind of move beyond MapReduce and move a lot of our workflows uh, on top of a project called Apache Spark. You guys familiar with Spark a little bit? Spark kind of came out of the AMP lab at Berkeley. And uh, Spark in many ways does for in-memory computing uh, what Hadoop did for like kind of large scale, like reliable disk uh, sort of like uh, failure, sorry, reliable processing of large amounts of data on disk. The thing that made Hadoop possible was the disk got really, really cheap. And uh, the same thing is basically happening to memory right now. Memory is getting really, really cheap. Um, Spark does kind of a generalization of the MapReduce programming model, and it also allows you to cache data sets in memory, which for machine learning computations that involve lots and lots of iterations over the same data is very, very powerful. It helps us speed things up a great deal. Uh, so we are basically gonna take a lot of the algorithms in Oryx move them over to Spark, and ideally contribute them to the Spark project itself. We at Cloudera, we're not really interested in being in the model building business per se. We'd like to help out. There's gonna be lots and lots of different algorithms, lots and lots of different models. People should be able to pick their favorite one, but that's not like something that's really core for us to do. The gaps that I'm interested in now are how do we make models that are built in kind of an investigative context easy to move into operational contexts? How do we make it easy to build a model that someone builds in R or SAS or scikit-learn in some kind of investigative context just on a local machine and do in-database scoring with that model and then deploy that model onto a storm cluster so that we can do streaming scoring, we can score items in real time. And then how do we move that model further on into a, like a REST server where we can be doing production decisions on top of that model as well? That's, that's the kind of stuff that really does it for me right now. Along with the model building uh, kind of kind of framework, I always wonder if anyone else besides me finds this slide funny. And the answer is basically no. I think it's, it's, not, it's not quite conclusively proven, but I, I, anyway, I love this sketch. Um, a lot of model building, a lot of model fitting stuff really comes down to parameter tuning. That's really what it's about. There's a parameter space that we need to explore in order to find the kind of optimal parameter configuration for our models. This is a fairly tedious and awful process. I would think of it as like another bottleneck inside of our sort of like machine learning pipeline, pipeline building process. So the extent to which we can embed uh, this parameter exploration, this sort of tuning process into the model fitting process itself that we do in Spark, I think we're gonna make data scientists much, much happier. We can like largely automate this, this fairly tedious exercise. All right, that's one other thing we're working on. Okay, Let's see how this one goes over. I always forget this is an animated GIF, so I apologize to you, I'll try to like get through this slide quickly so you're not staring at Lindsay Lowen for a long time. Um, so our models aren't perfect, right? No model is. Every model is surrounded by business rules, thresholds, uh, everywhere in every kind of system, right? Um, the Google ad system is a great example of this. There's not really a way for you to deploy sort of a single new component, like a single new ad prediction model into Google's ad system and have it like automatically make you more money. That just absolutely never happens, right? The feedback loops, the tuning parameters, it's way too complicated to just assume that making one piece better will actually make the overall system better, okay? Google has lots of objectives they're trying to optimize for. Um, I always said that ad people had kind of a harder problem than search people. Search people only have to make the user happy within the kind of constraints of Google's resources. Ad people have to make Google money, make advertisers like ROI, like make them money, and like ideally make the user happy, at least not piss them off too much. It's like a three body problem, that's a good problem. The other great example of this is uh, friend recommendations in social networks. You would think that if you were building a model to do kind of predict friend recommendations in social networks, you would say, uh, okay, well I'll just try to create a model that can maximize the probability that this person will add this other person as a friend. And that's fine, but that's not really the whole point of the model. 
for the social network. The objective of the social network is to keep you at the social network. They don't want you to go someplace else. So I don't have any evidence of this or anything, but I, I strongly suspect that Facebook mixes in attractive members of the opposite sex into my regular sort of recommendations, like friend recommendations, knowing that I will click on their profiles and hopefully accidentally click on an ad at some point, that kind of thing. Um, the thing the model is trying to do is not always the thing the business is trying to do. That's important to keep in mind. Um, and because of that, we run lots and lots of experiments when we're building data products. For me, data products and experimentation go hand in hand. Um, I wrote uh, the sort of the Java version of Google's uh, multivariate testing framework. We say multivariate testing in engineering. We don't say A-B testing. A-B testing is what marketing does. We do multivariate testing. Very important to make that distinction, right? Um, so code I wrote, this is like a good ego thing for me because God knows I need more of that. Uh, code I wrote uh, gets exercised a few trillion times a day on Google's website. Like a lot of code goes through this experiment framework. Uh, what it was designed for was really for doing experimentations around parameter spaces. Instead of just doing option A versus option B, let's define an entire space of parameters, thresholds, rules, model weights, all that kind of stuff, and explore that space and find some optimal combination for all the different metrics we're trying to optimize. Uh, Google kind of fairly quickly ran out of traffic, like ran out of traffic on Google.com. You'd think of all people, Google wouldn't run out of traffic, but they did uh, in about 2007 or so. And they came up with the overlapping experiment framework. So when you do a query on Google, you're not in one experiment, you're in about 20 experiments at the same time. Uh, search UI, ads UI, various machine learning models, language models, all kinds of different stuff is being experimented with whenever you do a query on Google. And that's what their framework was designed to do. Um, to the extent that Cloudera has a product strategy, it's think of stuff we loved at Google and write open source versions of it. Um, it's worked reasonably well so far. So I loved, I loved the experiment framework, and so I wrote a, a version of it, and I called it Gertrude. I open sourced it a few weeks ago, right when we did Oryx. Um, I named it after this woman who's Gertrude Cox, who was the uh, first person to earn a master's degree in statistics in the United States, which she earned from Iowa State University. No applause for Iowa State. Okay, that's okay, one person. All right, that's fine. All right. Um, I love her. She's, like, this is like she does this back in the 30s, right? She founds uh, the statistics department at NC State University. She's a huge figure in American statistics. They're doing an interview with her, uh, with her when she's in her 70s. Uh, she's like, you know, much older and kind of retired. And they asked her, like, Gertrude, why did you major in math? Like, back in the 30s. That was a very strange thing for a woman to do. Why did you major in math? And she said, because it was easy. Damn straight, right? This is someone who needs to have a framework named after them. That's awesome. All right. Let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, you guys all know uh, command line flags, right? I write a server, I define a bunch of command line flags, and I give values for those command line flags, and those values are fixed for the lifetime of a server, all right? In Gertrude, we do the same thing, except we create these things called experiment flags. And experiment flags are allowed to change on a per request basis. Okay, but other than that, they look a lot like command line flags. They can be strings or ints or doubles or whatever we want, right? Uh, and we create a configuration file that contains very simple kind of if-then rules for calculating the values of these flags for different requests, okay? So it could be like if the country is the United States and the person is in this segment, set this value to X. If it's, you know, Bermuda and it's like some other condition is true, set the value to Y or multiply the value by some factor, something like that. Very, very simple if-then logic. Definitely easy enough for a data scientist to understand. Dare I say, easy enough for a product manager to understand. Setting the bar very low here. Uh, in addition to that, we separate the data push and the code push, all right? So code goes out, right? It's got a bunch of experiment flags compiled inside of it. New features are kind of hidden behind Boolean flags that are kind of currently turned off. And we want to turn those experiments on or explore the parameters or try out a feature. Um, we basically push out a little tiny data file that gets generally sort of pushed out via Zookeeper or uh, Google's kind of internal version of Zookeeper is called Chubby. Uh, it gets picked up by all the servers, new experiment configurations get loaded, and we can like run little tiny experiments and validate that they work. This is sort of like where the DevOps piece of this comes in in a major way, because if you don't have a DevOps culture, this is going to freak out your ops team. Like crazy data scientists pushing out experiments is, is generally kind of scary. Um, on the back end side, we write all of our experiment IDs, all the experiments that any given request is inside of, into our logs, which you guys know how much I love logs. I don't need to talk about that anymore. 
Uh, and then we write ETL pipelines that process those logs and generate confidence intervals for our experiments. We have kind of control experiments and then the actual sort of stuff we're interested in. And we generate confidence intervals to figure out whether or not our experiment is making a meaningful difference in the metrics that we care about. And we publish all these things to an experiment's dashboard, okay, where we're typically looking at like 95% confidence intervals for all of our different observations, all of our different metrics, to see if our metric is making a meaningful difference. If you're a statistician, um, you'll probably holler at me about something called multiple comparisons. Multiple comparisons is a big problem in statistics. If you have 95% confidence intervals and you have 100 things you're looking at that you're testing, uh, five of those are gonna be basically bogus according to statistics theory. That's what a 95% confidence interval tells you. 5% of the things you're seeing are not really there, right? They're too low or they're too high. That's, that's a very you know, shoddy data science-esque way to explain confidence intervals to people. Um, I'll try to do a better job of that later. And what I find is that people basically kind of develop this sort of internal Bayesian mechanism. They know how the system works. They know how the metrics tend to move together. And you would see this in healthcare as well, right? You, you know that like a person has obesity issues, you can basically predict what other problems they would have. And if they have those problems but their obesity is like very low, they're not obese, you probably might say, well, that's kind of strange for like a non-obese person to have all those problems. It might actually be more likely that a person actually is obese and we just have a data quality problem. So it's like the same kind of idea there. I threw a few links that I love. Um, this presentation is actually up online because I gave a very similar presentation at Day to Day Texas and I'm actually thrilled that we get to record it now. But I posted some links that I love. Uh, one is the original paper on Google's overlapping experiment framework. Uh, the second one is, is uh, actually Microsoft's experiment team has a wonderful, wonderful collection of papers and resources on doing large scale experimentation. Uh, and then last but not least, Dean Eccles, who's a data scientist at Facebook, uh, wrote a post about doing very large scale, very efficient, very scalable computations of confidence intervals uh, that is essentially the thing that is used by Google and Facebook and Twitter and Netflix and LinkedIn and basically every, every web company ever is, essentially uses this trick. Um, and yeah, and with that, I've talked for a really long time. So thank you guys very, very much. I very much appreciate it. So any questions? Questions about anything? Questions about crunch? That's fine too. Why did you do this? Because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, let's see. I just totally nailed the presentation. I love when that happens. Every question possible was answered. So if a software engineer wants to start experimenting with what kind of stuff? Um, learn more about data science. Learn more, if a software engineer wants to learn more about data science, okay. Um, I think that, I, I'm, so, I'm somewhat biased here about how, how exactly do we teach software engineers about data science. Um, the thing that I'm, I'm most interested in seeing software engineers learn is, is actually good sort of data analysis practices. How do, uh, how does someone conduct an analysis? How do you formulate a question well and come up with like various sort of quantitative ways to answer it? Uh, and I'm, I'm actually a big baseball fan. And there's a wonderful book uh, called Baseball Between the Numbers. And it's written by the baseball prospectus people. Uh, it's like Nate Silver's old, old buddies basically wrote this book. And they just go through a bunch of like questions around baseball, things like, uh, is there such a thing as a good catcher? Is it, is it possible that like there are catchers who make pitchers better? in any sense, right? And the answer, it turns out, is basically no. There, there's no such thing as like a catcher who, who actually improves his pitchers. But they approach that question from like six or seven different angles, six, and se six or seven different ways of answering it. And I think the thing that I think, I think the thing that I think, yeah, that was impressive, uh, that software engineers really need to know is just sort of like how to like think through an analysis, how to think through a question. And I think that, you know, I, I have this sort of uh, this theory uh, that you know, in order to be a great writer, you have to be a great reader, right? In order to be a great programmer, the, all the great programmers I know are great code readers. You guys know what I'm talking about? They're really good at reading code. They can just like, you know, blow through stuff and understand it. And I think the may, same thing may be true for data analysts as well. Like to be a great data analyst, you have to observe, you know, and read and kind of understand uh, other great data analysis, and then kind of take that, take those lessons, and try to do it yourself. So. Um, 
like I said, I'm a baseball fan. If there's a, you know, there's a guy named Trey Cossey who does football and like basketball and all kinds of stuff. So whatever your sport is. And for people who don't like sports, I'm, I'm still working on it, but I'll come up with something. Yeah. Yes, hey. Hello. Yeah. Hey. Hey, um, I just have a question. Like, how would you know whether to apply uh, any machine learning on, on your model? Or, and if you somehow find out that, yeah, machine learning is needed, how do you know which algorithm to use? Or like, how yeah. do you? Oh, that's great. So I don't have to repeat that question, right? That's fine. Um, yeah, so there's a wonderful, wonderful uh, kind of, I guess that's a two-part question, right? How do I know if machine learning is worthwhile? Um, I think my default assumption is that it's probably not. My default assumption is that something simple will work, right? Um, you know, I, I have a favorite little anecdote, which is a Google spell correction algorithm, right? Uh, so Google spell correction algorithm, you guys might have heard this before because Ryan talked about it, possibly. Did he, he ruined it for everyone? Thanks a lot, Ryan. Appreciate it. He stole that from me, for what it's worth, right? Um, yeah, most things are very simple, and counting stuff usually works. Uh, so by and large, like fairly simple rules usually work reasonably well. Uh, trying to think when there's sort of cases, I think a lot of times some recommendation use cases are fairly obvious. You know, whenever you're kind of trying to discover hidden items in a space in some sense, there's like a huge space of content, huge space of products, and you're trying to surface that information for people. I think that recommendation engines fall out of that very naturally, and it's kind of easy to identify. That's a good use case there. Uh, I think that like clustering models and kind of unsupervised learning techniques like k-means clustering are great for anomaly detection problems. Um, the kind of ironic thing is you do a big clustering and you end up with these clusters that kind of summarize your data set in some sense. And then after you have that summary, you want to apply it to your data to find things that look strange, that actually don't conform to any of the clusters, that are actually very far away from the clusters. And I think that like classification and prediction problems usually present themselves pretty well. I'm trying to predict the probability of say a hospital readmission and I have all this data and I have kind of an outcome that I'm trying to predict. And that's, that's like usually a fairly natural fit. Uh, Scikit-learn, which is sort of the Python uh, machine learning library, has this wonderful like sort of, it's called the Scikit-learn cheat sheet. And it actually takes you through kind of like what are these sort of aspects of your problem and what is the right Scikit-learn machine learning model to use for that kind of, for like for that kind of problem. So uh, yeah, Scikit-learn cheat sheet is kind of wonderful. I recommend that. All right. Oh, hey, how's it going? Um, what is more good um, way to design the model, the metadata around the data or the data itself? Like, which one you, would you go for? Mm. That's a great question. Uh, it would depend on how much I would trust the metadata, I think would be my answer. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of a control freak when it comes to my data. I think that's sort of one of the reasons I became a data scientist. Um, and one of the reasons I like sort of logs-based data analysis is that I can usually go right and I mean, since, you know, again, I was at least once nominally a software engineer. I can go right into the code and look at it and actually see what's being written and kind of understand what's going on. Um, there are other like data analysts and statisticians who kind of rely on data dictionaries, right, metadata descriptions of data uh, in order to kind of like have someone else do their provenance for them, have someone else do their data cleansing and acquisition because it's tedious and awful and they don't want to do that. Uh, I'm not super comfortable with that personally. Like I don't, I, I like knowing where my data com came from and I like knowing kind of how it came about. Uh, so yeah, I, I think, you know, it would depend on, I'm sorry to give you like an it depends kind of answer, but it, it would depend on the context in some sense. But I, I mean, that's, that's maybe my perspective on that. Fair enough. Uh, it's okay. All right. Cool. Thank you, guys.